preparing my talk, I uh, was trying to think back uh, what connections I've had with, uh, with Marcel Berger. So actually, I met him a couple of times, a couple of times in the, the early 90s. Um, but uh, I think I had uh, much more mathematical contact. Uh, I mean, in the sense that I was inspired by his work in various ways. Um, in particular, I think he was, he was very interested in positive curvature, which is a topic which has a very strong uh, intuitive appeal from the point of view of visual geometry. So, uh, and maybe uh, one of the most fascinating questions there is, uh, is this con conjecture of Hopf, right, that uh, S2 cross S2 does not have a metric with positive sexual curvature. I think uh, there are a number of us who've spent time thinking about this, maybe not with much, uh, pro making much progress. Um, so early in my career, uh, I made this, this observation with uh, Wu Yixiang, um, which is simply, if there is a counterexample, it can't have much symmetry. Its symmetry group has to be finite, possibly trivial, right? So at the time, Initially, I, I, I remember being quite excited by this because it seemed to be some sort of indication in support of the Hopf conjecture. But the more I thought about it, uh, the more it, it, I began to think that it was more of a sign that there's tension between the Hopf conjecture and symmetry. And in fact, uh, I'll go as far as to, to do, make the following statement. So let's say G, GS2 is just the standard round metric on the two-sphere. Uh, so then I'll, I'll conjecture the opposite of Hoff, that in fact, uh, not only is there metric with positive curvature, but you can approximate the product metric with this. Now, uh, before you dismiss this out of hand, let me mention that, uh, in fact, there are, uh, I mean, this isn't completely random. Uh, if you take, look at metrics which have a lot of symmetry, like they're invariant under the product SO3 cross SO3, then they're basically product metrics, they have to have a lot of zero curvature, okay? On the other hand, if you reduce the symmetry assumption, <coughs> Cheeger produced metrics which have fewer, fewer two planes of, of zero curvature, right? And the more you reduce the, cur the symmetry assumption, the less flatness uh, is required, okay? And, and to date, there's no argument that, uh, that would contradict this. And uh, so th that's, that's uh, yeah, so. Um, okay, so let me move on to the main subject of the talk, which is uh, completely different. Um, so I'm gonna be looking at uh, smooth manifolds, so X is a compact, uh, connected smooth manifold, and some reasons is put it inserting extra. I don't know what's doing this. Um, so diff X is going to be the set of smooth diffeomorphisms, okay, with the C infinity topology. Uh, diff zero is just the com com component of the identity, okay. So these are uh, these are diffeomorphisms that are isotopic to the identity. And uh, now met X is going to be my notation for the space of smooth metrics, okay? Smooth Romani metrics, again, C infinity topology. Um, and uh, met with this subscript K identically C is gonna be the subspace of metrics with constant sectional curvature C, okay? With the subspace topology. Okay, so the main, uh, main question motivating the talk is, uh, is this. So wh what can you say about the topology? of diff, the space of different morphisms, okay? So, uh, the, well, the motivation, there's several motivations, so just for, from a purely naive point of view, uh, after you can address classification questions, better not touch that, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, right, after you can classify manifolds up to diffeomorphism, then the next question is, can you classify the mappings? Okay, which means, which boils down to understanding the structure of diff, okay? Um, and, and in fact, people were studying this since going back to the 1920s, uh, although it's for the, the homeomorphism group rather than the diffeomorphism group. Um, uh, so another reason for looking at this is it's a natural refinement of, of the mapping class group. The mapping class group is just the quotient diff 
modulo the identity component, right? So diffeomorphisms modulo isotopy, or isotopy classes of diff diffeomorphisms. Uh, and that's something that uh, shows up all over the place and has been studied for a very long time, okay? Um, another motivation is, uh, well, if you're studying smooth fiber bundles where the fiber is X, but the structure group is the full diffeomorphism group, you need to understand uh, the structure of diff in order to classify those, okay? <laughs> Okay, so uh, the talk is going to focus on, well, on dimensions less than or equal to three. Of course, there's a discussion in higher dimensions, but, uh, well, at least compared to the, the low dimensional case, very little is known, and what is known is mainly kind of asymptotic. Um, but I'm going to be focusing almost entirely on dimension three after some initial comments about the, the, the lower dimensional case. Okay, so... Um, so let's start with dimension one. So we're looking at the circle, right? There's not much going on there. So you have uh, O2, the orthogonal group, acting on the unit circle. So O2 embeds in diff S S1, right? And this is a deformation retract. Okay, you can do this in any number of ways. You can, ap you can apply a heat flow to deform a diffeomorphism to an isometry or you can lift the universal cover and use a straight line, iso uh, straight line isotopy. Uh, it, it's uh, fairly trivial, okay? So now let's move to dimension two. So starting with the two sphere in 59, Smale showed that if you look at O3, the orthogonal group, so that, that's a group uh, sitting in the, well, acting on the, the two sphere by isometries, that's, that's a, a subgroup of diff, and, uh, and, and the analogous statement is true. This is a homotopy equivalence. So, in fact, uh, this is not, I guess, you know, using modern technology, you, you, can, you can say this is a, a, an elementary result, at least depending upon your definition of elementary, but it's decidedly non-trivial, okay, compared to the, the one-dimensional case. Um, so let me just mention the... The analog for ho the homeomorphism group was studied by uh, Knazer back in the 20s. Right. So uh, what I want to do first is to give a proof of this, this theorem of Smale. It's going to be different from Smale's proof, but I want to present this argument because it will motivate what I do later in the talk. Okay? And it will also give some idea of flavor of the arguments uh, that people have used in this area. Okay, so uh, the first step is to... <coughs> Is, is this reduction. So in this lemma, I want to show that this assertion that the orthogonal group, the inclusion here is a homotopy equivalence, is equivalent to showing that this space of curvature one metrics on the two sphere is contractible. Okay? This is my first step. So what's the proof of this? Well, let's, uh, let's, look, at, um, let's look at the diffeomorphism group of S2. Okay? So this acts on this space of metrics by push forward, right? If you're given a metric with curvature one, you're given a diff diffeomorphism, well, you push forward that metric, you get another metric with curvature one, right? So that's my action. Um, and now uh, this, is, this, this is a transitive action, right? Because if you have two metrics with curvature one in the two sphere, they're isometric to one another. Uh, well, that means then that we have a transitive action of a group, so we can think of this space of metrics as a coset space of the group that's acting modulo the stabilizer of our favorite element, right, which we can take to be, let's say, the standard metric on S2. So this is the isometric group of the standard two-sphere with respect to, the, I mean, the two-sphere with respect to the standard metric, which is just O3, right? Just, this is really just, just O3 in disguise, okay? Um, and, okay, so now we have a coset space uh, uh, in a finite dimensional case. We would immediately say, well, now we have a fiber bundle here, right? We have th the big group, the subgroup, and the quotient, the coset space, and we have a fibration. Okay, this is infinite dimensional, but it turns out it's not hard to justify. This, this is, again, a fiber bundle. Uh, it's, it's not that hard to, to check. Um, and now, just use the exact homotopy sequence of the fibration, right? So. Uh, we know that the, you know, the, this inclusion is a, is a homotopy equivalence if and only if it induces an isomorphism on homotopy groups, 
and that, that's equivalent to saying that this, this guy has trivial homotopy groups, right? Where it's contractible, okay? So that, that's, that's all there is to it. So we're reduced to showing that this space of curvature one matrix is contractible. So let's use Ricci flow, right? So Hamilton showed if you have, uh, if you have a compact smooth manifold, you pick your favorite Ramanian metric, H, well, then you can evolve that in some canonical way, right? So there's a unique solution to the Ricci flow equation, time derivative is minus twice Ricci, with the given initial condition. And when I say maximal, I mean defined on a maximal time interval. Uh, so this, uh, this solution is defined on a maximal interval, this capital T is maximal. Um, and he also showed that if this, this right endpoint is finite, well, then what's going on is that the curvature is blowing up as you approach this, this right endpoint, okay? So it's called, usually called the blow-up time. All right, so let's come back to our, our situation. So Hamilton, uh, well, and Chow have the following results. So Hamilton did this for metrics with positive curvature. Chow did the general case. So they showed that if you take a Ricci any Ricci flow on S2, regardless of the initial condition, well, then it always blows up in finite time, okay? And in fact, what happens as, as the, the time approaches uh, capital T, as it approaches this, this blow up time, then, uh, then the curvature is blowing up everywhere. And in fact, modulo rescaling, so modulo appropriate normalization, something very simple is happening. Namely, it's converging to, say, a constant curvature metric. Right? So it's blowing up, but it's blowing up just because it's sort of shrinking down, diameter is going to zero, but modulo rescaling, it's actually converging nicely to this constant curvature metric, all right? Um, okay, so that gives us this metric G bar. Well, uh, then the corollary, I don't, know, I don't know if you can see that, unfortunately, it's a little bit low. Oh. Okay, corollary, uh, well, this, this, um, the space of curvature one metrics, is a deformation retract of the space of all metrics, right? So we take any metric, we've deformed it to a metric with constant curvature. Okay, well, there's something that has to be checked. You need to make sure that this process here depends continuously on the initial condition, but that follows in a straightforward way from the proofs. I mean, you have uniform exponential decay of curvature and derivatives. Okay, so that takes care of uh, the two-sphere. Um, but let me just mention that, uh, so I, this argument used the equivalence of this this assertion with the second guy here, but in fact, uh, using a similar, I mean, arguments of a similar, similar flavor using these vibrations, you can prove it's equivalent to any number of other uh, nice, sound, uh, nice uh, statements. For example, you can look at the space of embedded circles in R2, right? The contractibility of that space is equivalent to this. So for example, you can prove the contractibility of the space of circles using either curve shortening flow or maybe the Riemann mapping theorem. You look at the disk bounded by the curve and then use that to, to, to home on top of it. Um, you can also, it's also equivalent to saying that the, if you look at the, the two disk, well then the, the, the space of diffeomorphisms of the two disk, which are the identity on the boundary, or fix the, the boundary point wise, that that's contractible, okay? So this is, some, this is the thing that, that Smale used. He has a, a beautiful uh, low-tech uh, proof of this, uh, this statement. Uh, you can also use conformal geometry, which is arguably the, 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 the cleanest way to do it. Um, okay, what about other surfaces? So let's look at, say, an or orientable surface of genus G at least one. Um, okay, so then, so diff zero is the identity component. So then uh, there are two cases here. If the genus is at least two, its identity component is contractible, right? So, uh, and um, if the genus is one, then the identity component is, is a deformation retracts to a torus, okay? Namely, you just, genus is one, you're looking at a torus, the isometry group of that torus will be uh, a deformation retract of the identity component of diff. And uh, well, the rest of the diff diffeomorphism group, you can sort of think of, you can think of the analysis of the diffeomorphism group as being broken up into two pieces. This is cheating a little bit, but anyway, roughly speaking, you look at the identity component and then you look at the quotient, the mapping class group, right? And that mapping class group is 
been understood uh, for a long time, at least on this level. Okay, uh, so let's go to dimension three. And uh, so the first case to look at is uh, the three sphere. Right? Um, so Smale conjectured this in, in 61. So this is the analog of what we were just discussing in dimension two. Um, so, uh, so this, uh, a few years later, Jean Serf showed that, um, that this is true on the level of path components or on the level of pi zero, um, right, that, uh, that this inclusion induces a bijection on, on path components. Uh, but then uh, there was little progress made on this for a long time. So something like uh, 20 years went by, uh, and then finally Alan Hatcher proved this, this conjecture in 83. Um, so his approach is, uh, is to use uh, another equivalent statement. So th 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 this, what I proved earlier in the, in the case of the two-sphere, has uh, an, an analog in dimension three. So the smell conjecture here is equivalent to uh, the contractibility of the space of embedded two spheres in R3. Okay. It's also equivalent to the contractibility of the space of curvature one metrics on S3. Um, so his argument, I mean, it's, it's, it's a long, uh, uh, well, let's say rather subtle argument. It's, it's somehow a mix of combinatorial techniques and smooth techniques. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that this, this argument is not very well understood. Um, okay, so uh, a question that's been around for a long time uh, for people who work in the area, is, is there some way of proving this using geometric analysis, right? For example, you look at the space of two spheres in R3. You could ask, is there some natural geometric process which takes a two sphere and isotopes it, isotopes it through a round two sphere? Okay, maybe using mean curvature flow or some other uh, natural flow. Okay, um, right. So depending upon your interpretation of that question, uh, this might uh, what I'm going to say in the rest of the talk might be a, an affirmative answer, or it might not be, depending upon your <laughs> your definition. Okay. Um, so uh, what what about other three manifolds? So. Uh, so there's a, what's, what's usually called the generalized, sm generalized smell conjecture, or the smell conjecture for X, um, it goes as follows. So <coughs> suppose I have a metric GX uh, on X with cur constant curvature C, okay? Here I'm gonna require C is, is plus or minus one, okay? So, and, uh, so if C is one, then, then I have a metric of constant sectional curvature one, which means I'm looking at a spherical space form, right? C is minus one, then this is a hyperbolic manifold. So, so the assertion, the assertion is that if I look at the isometry group of this nice constant curvature metric, then the inclusion of that into diff is a homotopy equivalence, right? So you can see all the complexity, topological com homotopical complexity of the diffeomorphism group just in the isometry group of this maximally symmetric metric, right? And, and this is a generalization of the Smale conjecture, because if we take this to be the three-sphere, then this is just the standard three-sphere. The isometry group is 0, 04, right? <coughs> so uh, note the, just as we had these other equivalent statements in the, in the case of the, the three-sphere, uh, this generalized Smale conjecture is equivalent to the contractibility of the space of constant curvature metrics, okay? Uh, so using a similar argument. So the main, the main theorem uh, that I'm going to be discussing today, so this is joint work with Richard Bemler, uh, is, um, is this. So same, set, same setup as here. So a metric of constant curvature C. C is plus or minus 1. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exclude the case when X is the three-sphere or RP3. Okay. So uh, then, then the space is contractible. Uh, just to be sure, I understand. when C is minus one, doesn't most to rigidly answer the question? 
No, that just that just uh, that just tells you something about the uh, about the isometry group, right? You're trying to right think about it, the the statement is comparing the isometry group with diff. So morally speaking, you're saying, well, given any diffeomorphism, you need to isotop that to an isometry by a process which varies continuously with the diffeomorphism you started with, right? So. So M Mostow tells you what uh, tells you that uh, right that if you have a um, well it tells you different things. I mean it tells you that uh, if you have two metric two hyperbolic metrics then uh, then any any homotopy equivalence. If they're different, then they uh, they isomorphic. They don't have a relationship between the diffeomorphisms, right? Um, Okay, so uh, so the idea, well, uh, as I in, based on what I've said so far, is to somehow use Ricci flow, and uh, one nice feature of this is that the, you have we end up with a proof which kind of works uniformly, whether in, whether we're written positive curvature or negative curvature. Okay, um, so uh, let me mention. So the argument that I'm going to discuss today excludes these two cases. Uh, and I'll explain why in, in, in a little bit. Uh, there's another argument, also based on Ricci flow. It's it's more involved, which works, uh, which includes these cases. So it doesn't exclude them. Uh, we're in the process of writing that, that now. I'm not going to not going to discuss that today. Um, okay. So let me mention uh, what was previously known here. So first of all, I already mentioned the case of S3. Uh, of the general, I'm talking about the previously known cases of the generalized Mill conjecture. All right, so Hatcher did the case when X is S3. Um, the case when, when you have a hyperbolic manifold was also known. So uh, when it's hyperbolic in Hocken, meaning there's an embedded incompressible surface, uh, this, this goes back to, uh, to Hatcher and Ivanov in, in 76. Uh, the non hawken case was much more difficult and it was proved by Gabay using uh, previous work joint with um, several people, I've forgotten the, the co-authors using, I call it non-coalescible non insulator uh, technology. Um, anyway, this is a very long story and the proof is, is partly computer assisted. Um, and then in the case of spherical space forms, so there, there are different techniques, uh, and so those were able to handle certain spherical space forms. So lens spaces other than RP3, and then prism and quaternionic manifolds. So basically, uh, on the level of fundamental group, le lens spaces are the ones with cyclic fundamental group. These guys are uh, dihedral cross-cyclic, and these are quaternionic, the quaternions cross-cyclic, okay? So these are, uh, these are, uh, Three infinite families, and then there are three other infinite families, the guys which are uh, tetrahedral, octahedral, and dodecahedral cross-cyclic cross groups. Okay? So th those are the ones, the new ones that are covered by the theorem. Um, okay, uh, so let me say a little bit before I start talking about the proof. Let me talk about other three manifolds. Uh, so that the same question, what, is diff, what does diff x look like? So for simplicity, I'll assume that I'll look at orientable manifolds and assume that they're irreducible, meaning any embedded two-sphere bounds a three-ball. Okay. <coughs> so uh, so let's look at the case when the manifold is Hawken. Right? This means it has a closed embedded pi one injective surfa surface of uh, non-positive Euler characteristic. So. Uh, so what can we s one say about diff? Well, it's pretty well understood. So uh, kind of on, on the level of, of pi zero, oops. <laughs> um, so if you look at the mapping class group, diff mod diff zero, then, uh, then Waldhausen showed that this, so you have a natural map from this to uh, the set of homotopy equivalences up to homotopy, okay? So self-homotopy equivalences up to homotopy. And, and Waldhausen showed that this map is, is an isomorphism, right? So in words, it says, right, given a, a self-homotopy equivalence of x, you can realize that by a diffeomorphism up to homotopy, and given two diffeomorphisms, 
if they're homotopic, they're isotopic. Okay. Um, uh, so then you're, in some sense, reduced to, to understanding the identity component. And this was handled by Hatcher and Ivanov. So this is actually predated Hatcher's pay, uh, w w theorem for uh, S3. And so it was a conditional result at the time they proved this. Um, it assumed the, the smale conjecture. In any case, they showed diff zero is homotopy equivalent to a K torus where K is the rank of the center. So for example, you take a three torus, right? The identity component is homotopy equivalent to a three torus. Or if you take, say, a surface of genus two, cross a circle, then the identity component just comes from a circle, right? Um, okay. Now, uh, so what does this tell you? So, of course, this wasn't known at the time of, of this work, but after Perelman proved the, the geometrization conjecture, um, and, and since this takes care of the Hawken cases, uh, the, the, what was left to be done is the non hawken case, right? And those, by geometrization, uh, are geometrizable manifolds. So those, those admit geometric structures modeled on one of these geometries here, okay? And um, so these, these, the, these last three are uh, ciphered fibered, where the base, these two have hyperbolic base and these have Euclidean base. Uh, this one has Euclidean base. Uh, and so it was shown in 2013 that, uh, that in these two, uh, the case where the base is hyperbolic, so the, the, these two cases here, uh, you have a statement similar to this, okay? So one understands uh, diff in those cases. So that leaves only S3, H3, and nil. So H3 was already handled, as I mentioned. Um, and so we've, we're f we've just finished off the spherical case. And actually, the Ricci, Ricci flow does give an approach to, the, to the, the, the final case as well. So this will finish the story completely. Um, OK, so um, I, I guess, yeah. So let's come back to the proof of the, the main theorem. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, so let's say we'll look at a spherical space form. I mean, the proof in the hyperbolic case is, is completely parallel. Um, so uh, we want to show that the space of curvature one metrics is contractible, right? So the idea uh, is to use Ricci flow the way we did for the two-sphere, right? Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ricci flow in dimension three is vastly more complicated than Ricci flow in, in, in 2D, okay? So in particular, in the 2D case, when the thing blows up, that's blow it's blowing up because he's, you're seeing an asymptotically round metric, you just rescale and, and you have a very nice picture. And, and in, in dimension three, it's much more complicated. So what the idea is to actually implement this, we need to, to use a notion of Ricci flow through singularities. So this was developed uh, by John Lott, Richard Bemler, and myself in the last few years. Uh, and putting this all together, what you get is some canonical evolution that's defined for any initial metric. And it depends, in an appropriate sense, depends continuously on the initial condition, okay? So what I'm gonna do next is spend uh, a little time kind of re re recapping uh, this, this theory. All right, so, um, and then I'll come back to the proof at the end. Uh, okay. So in dimension three, well, if you start with a standard metric on the three sphere, then the Ricci flow at time t is the standard, the original metric multiplied by this linearly decreasing function, right? So this blows up as t goes to one quarter. This thing shrinks down to a point. Uh, on the other hand, if you if you have a kind of a barbell metric on S three. Um, then, then what you see is a neck pinch singularity. So let me, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna first give some heuristics and draw some nice pictures and, and do some storytelling, and then I'll converge to some mathematics after a little while, okay? So, uh, so you should think of some sort of initial condition like this. It has two roughly spherical pieces with some neck size, sizes, scales R1, R3, and in the middle R2. So if these are if the neck is sufficiently close, neck size is sufficiently close to the size of these other two spherical regions, then things kind of round off. As you go forward in time, it eventually has positive curvature, and then you'll see asymptotically you'll see the same simple nice behavior that we saw before. Okay, it becomes asymptotically round. Um, 
Uh, on the other hand, if the neck size is a lot smaller than the sizes of these two guys, then uh, it will shrink faster. There's an instability here. And a, you'll see a neck forming, and then it will kind of want, it, want to pinch off. Okay? And so what, what, what will occur is that, so if you ran this forward in time, at the blow-up time, you would see that there's an open subset of the manifold on which the metric has a smooth limit locally as you approach the, the singular time. Okay? And elsewhere, the metric is blowing up. All right? So this is very different from what we saw before. What we saw before was that at the blow-up time, it blows up everywhere. Okay? And modulo, just a global rescaling, it's convergent. Okay? Very different now. So, uh, so how does one deal with this? Well, this led to the notion of uh, Ricci flow of surgery. So this was in introduced by Hamilton and developed initially by him and then uh, by Perelman. And the cartoon is as follows. So you start with some initial metric. You run the Ricci flow until a neck starts to form. Or in Perelman's case, you run it until you have a, a singularity, but you can stop a little bit earlier. Uh, and then inside this neck region, you, you try to identify, uh, let's say here and here, regions where you see neck-like geometry. So something that looks modular rescaling, like around two sphere cross r, to a small, uh, up to small error. Okay? And then in those neck regions, you cut the manifold, and you throw away the part which has high curvature, and then you cap off the two two sphere boundary components with three disks, okay? with appropriately chosen geometry. So after surgery, you see something that looks like this. Now you have a compact manifold, compact Romanian manifold, and you can restart re the Ricci flow. Okay? So this kind of alternating process is the Ricci flow of surgery. Um, okay? And uh, even though this may seem a little bit ad hoc, uh, it has spectacular applications, right? So uh, by using this, uh, Perelman was able to implement Hamilton's original vision for proving the geometrization conjecture, in particular, three-dimensional Poincaré conjecture. So actually, um, uh, even though, you know, yeah, question. Yeah, so all, singular all the singularities look like this, like S2 cross R and something. Well, okay, so the, uh, these are cartoons, right? Uh, so I'm suppressing a lot of complications, but uh, something I'll come to a little bit later may speak a little bit to your question, but the idea is that when you look at any part of the Ricci flow of surgery where the curvature is large, then the geometry looks like a model geometry. Okay, so there's a classification of the models, and what you see whenever the curvature is large is something that's geometrically close to one of these models. Okay, so I'll say a little bit more about this uh, in a few minutes. In any case, so this has a, this Ricci flow of surgery has a spectacular. Uh, application, but um, Perelman himself so, uh, was not entirely satisfied with, with this. I guess that's kind of characteristic of <laughs> Perelman, uh, right? So actually, he has a co comments in both of his, his uh, Ricci flow uh, preprints. So he says, it's likely that by passing to the limit in this construction, one would get a canonically defined Ricci flow through singularities, but at the moment, I don't have a proof of that. Uh, so what, what does he mean here? So imagine, th think about this Ricci flow with surgery process that I had in the previous cartoon, right? So you fix an initial metric, you run this Ricci flow through uh, Ricci flow with surgery, okay? Now you you start again, you run the Ricci flow with surgery, but you do the surgery at a finer scale, okay? So the, when you cut along necks, you do it along necks which have a smaller scale, okay? And now do a sequence of such Ricci flows of surgery where the surgery scale goes to zero. All right? So what he's saying is that this whole sequence of processes is somehow converging to some canonical evolution. All right? So that's, that's the intuition here. Uh, and I think the, the, I think the intuition at the time uh, is simply that, well, when you're doing the surgery at a fine scale, that somehow your intervention is kind of ad hoc. You're definitely doing something you're disturbing the flow, but, but your intervention is so small, it should be negligible. Okay? That's, that's somehow the intuition. Um, and in the second, the, the second preprint, where he actually proved geometrization, this is in the first paragraph, uh, he says, our approach is aimed at eventually constructing a canonical Ricci flow. Okay? 
So uh, that, that's, uh, that was what motivated John Lott uh, and I to start, start thinking about this, and then that was followed by the work with Richard. So, uh, so the cartoon that you should have in mind for the Rigi flow through singularities is something like this. So again, think of time as moving upward. These dotted pictures here correspond to time slices. And in contrast to what we saw before, uh, you, as you run forward in time, you know, this neck region here starts to pinch down. Well, and then at some moment, singular, you hit a singularity, and then it just keeps going and it resolves itself. Maybe this, these, uh, at, the, at the singular time, this thing would be maybe non-compact, have some sort of cusp-like cusp geometry, and similarly on the other side. But after the singular time, that will round off and resolve itself. Okay? So this is what you should have in mind. Um, and what Perelman is, is suggesting is that not only can you make sense of, of such, uh, an, uh, uh, such an object, but it's actually completely canonical and canonically determined by the initial metric, okay? All right, so, uh, so now I'll sort of move toward the pr uh, precise statement of this. And, and the first ingredient is to start thinking about Ricci flow spacetimes or a spacetime version of Ricci flow. So let's start by thinking about an ordinary Ricci flow defined, say, on some, on some manifold M, maybe compact. So it's defined on some time interval zero up to capital T. Well, from this data, we can cook up a space-time structure in, in kind of a completely obvious way. So let's let calligraphic M be the product, M cross the time interval. So on this product, we have the time function, right, just the, the map to the second factor. Then you have the time vector field, right, that's the, the vector field tangent to the second factor, right. Um, and a Ramanian metric, which, which isn't Ramanian metric on this space-time, but it's defined along the time slices, right? Defined on the, on the, along the foliation given by the time slices. Um, and the Ricci flow equation in the space-time picture reads as follows. So the, the lead derivative for the metric, which is defined just along the, the leaves, that's minus twice Ricci, okay? So, all right, so this motivates, should motivate the following definition. So a Ricci flow space-time is, this, is an object which locally looks like what I just talked about, okay? So, uh, so it's going to be, since we're interested in 3D Ricci flow, it's going to be a, a smooth four manifold of boundary. If this makes sense in any dimension, but who cares for now? Um, we have a time function taking values in the non-negative reals. Um, and a time vector field, when you hit the time function, with a time vector field, you get one, right? So if you take an integral curve of the time vector field, well, then the time function increases at rate one, right? Um, and then we have a Ramanian metric defined on the foliation given by the level sets of time, <coughs> right? So you have the time slices and a Ramanian metric defined along that foliation. And then you have the Ricci flow equation as before. So this is just, so locally, locally I can just take, locally I can look at, uh, choose a point, look at the time slice, and take a flow box for the time vector field, and then up to diffeomorphism, this is just the same as what I was talking about a second ago, right? So the point is that globally, this could look very different, right? It doesn't have to look like a product, things could be incomplete, and it, it opens the door to uh, a much more uh, pathological uh, structure. Um, or at least more general structure. So before I get to that, some notation. So m sub t, this will be the time t slice. m less than or equal to capital T, this is going to be the time slab ranging <coughs> between 0 and capital T. And rather than using this big tuple, I'll use capital M to, den to denote the whole thing, the way you denote a Ramanian manifold just by m, right? Um, OK. So, so this notion of a Ricci flow spacetime is much too weak to actually do anything. We need to impose some additional conditions. So, uh, the f so the, there are two conditions. There's a completeness type condition and another condition called a canonical neighborhood assumption. So uh, let me start with the completeness assumption. So let's, let's look at this cartoon. So in fact, the Ricci flow spacetimes are, are going to be typically incomplete in two senses. So Look at what happens when this neck, neck forms and pinches, right? So look at this singular time slice here in the cartoon. You should imagine that this, 
this, this time slice is actually a non-compact manifold, which has two ends, one corresponding to this, one corresponding to that. And the ends are diffeomorphic to S2 cross the non-negative reals, okay? And so for a generic neck pinch, th these will be incomplete manifolds, okay? So you can find, with respect to the Ramanian distance, you can find a Cauchy sequence going out this end, which has no limit, okay? So the time slice is, is going to be an incomplete Ramanian manifold. Okay. Now, if you look at the vector field, the time vector field, imagine starting on the, a point on the initial manifold, which has sort of the misfortune of going into the singularity here. Right? Then if you try to follow that trajectory, it's, it's going to be an incomplete trajectory. Right? So this is kind of built into the setup. Right? We, have, uh, this, we need to accommodate that. And, and the question? It's not part of M, okay? That's a very important point. So our whole philosophy here, so for people who work in other geometric flows and are used to thinking about kind of singular objects like, you know, verifold, Bracky flows, and whatever, our, our uh, we're taking completely the opposite approach. Everything is smooth. And the part, of the, part of the reason for this is just simply, if you did try to, try to put in, if you tried to recomplete, you'd end up with some sort of singular object and uh, you'd have to spend a lot of time worrying, you know, what does Ricci curvature me mean there, and so on and so forth, right? So it turns out that, that you get a completely tractable approach by working with smooth objects, okay? <coughs> okay, so what is the notion of completeness? So the idea, before you read this, the idea is just simply, okay, you can have incompleteness of time slices, incompleteness of the time vector field, but you'll only encounter that if if you move through regions with unbounded curvature, okay? So if you stay in a region with uniformly bounded curvature, then you don't experience incompleteness, okay? So the definition, I'll say it's zero complete if whenever you have a curve gamma, so an integral curve of plus or minus the time vector field, or a, a unit speed curve in a time slice, um, then, well, if the curvature, the norm of the curvature tensor remains bounded, along this curve gamma, then the limit exists, okay? So that's the notion of, of completeness. Um, and, and now I want to talk about this, this other notion, the, the canonical neighborhood assumption. So M satisfies the epsilon R canonical neighborhood assumption um, if the following holds. So you take a point in space-time, uh, let's say a time T slice, and and then let's suppose the norm of the curvature tensor at that particular point exceeds r to the minus 2 times t. So think of this r as being like a scale, so that, that, that has uh, scales like distance. So then the corresponding curvature, qu uh, curvature threshold would be r to the minus 2. So that's what this is doing on the right-hand side, okay? So if you look at a point in the time t slice where the curvature exceeds the threshold, th this threshold, well then, in fact, the, the time slice with base point at that x is epsilon close, uh, modulo rescaling by this, this curvature, to a pointed time slice in a kappa solution. Okay, so this comes back to the question that was posed earlier. A kappa solution is, or kappa solutions are these model solutions in dimension, uh, model Ricci flow solutions in dimension three. Um, I'm not going to define them, but I'll give you some examples. Right, so these are an example would be a shrinking round spherical spaceform, or a shrinking round cylinder, or a Bryant soliton, right, which is a model for, it's a, it's a steady sol soliton, which is a model, uh, wh which lives on R3, and it's kind of the, the model for uh, the evolution near kind of a fingertip region. You can think of after, after the neck pinch occurs, then you have these, I mean, intuitively, you have these re receding tip regions uh, here, and these are modeled. You can think of these be being modeled on these Bryant solitons. Um, so currently, the, I, I'm not going to give you the definition of kappa solution. Uh, there are a few more known examples, which I, I don't want to go into, but uh, th these, have, these have been sort of, I mean, Perelman classified them in a qualitative sense, which was, which was enough to implement his... Uh, surgery method, and it's enough for us to, to implement our construction. But um, you should think intuitively that, that these, are, these are the models. So what we're saying is that 
if you're at any point in the space-time where the curvature exceeds this threshold, then and you pick your point, well, you rescale it to normalize the curvature to be 1. And after you rescale, what you see looks close to uh, the model. Okay, so a big after you rescale, a big ball looks almost isometric in the CK topology with large K to, to one of these models. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the canonical neighbor assumption. And then our definition is, so singular Ricci flow is, is a Ricci flow space-time where the initial time, sli time slice is compact, it's zero complete, and it satisfies this canonical neighbor assumption. So, so John and I proved that if you have any compact Ramanian manifold, this is a three, we're in dimension three, of course, uh, then there exists such a singular Ricci flow with this as the initial condition, up to isometry, and, and that this satisfies the, uh, th this particular singular Ricci flow will satisfy, I mean, given an epsilon, it satisfies the epsilon R canonical neighborhood assumption, where this R depends on epsilon and the, the bounds on the geometry, the, the initial uh, data. Uh, and, and then uh, Richard and I proved uniqueness. So there's some threshold value for epsilon, so this is the quality of approximation by the, these model solutions, kappa solutions, so that if you have two singular Ricci flows and they satisfy the epsilon can R canonical neighborhood assumption for some R, well, then an isometry between their initial conditions extends to an isometry between the space times. Okay? So the comp as long as the quality of this canonical neighborhood assumption is better than some threshold, you get uniqueness. Okay? And the same methods tell you that, in an appropriate sense, the space-time depends continuously on the initial time slice. Okay? If you think for a minute, I, I, you realize the no I, there's something to be said here about what continuity means, because I'm saying you have continuity even in the presence of these singularities. Okay? But I'm not, not going to say what that is uh, at the moment. Um, and also, the same methods prove the conjecture that Perelman had made about the convergence of Ricci flow with surgery to a canonical process, okay? Which is the singular Ricci flow. All right, so, so, let's, so what properties does, do, do these guys have? So suppose we have a sp spherical space form other than S3 or RP3 <coughs> and take some initial metric G and calligraphic M will be the singular Ricci flow with th that as initial data, okay? So, what are the properties? Well, so this is kind of upgrading the things that I've said so far. So for every t, at most one connected component of the time slice is diffeomorphic to x with finitely many punctures, I mean finitely many points removed. Okay, so we start with some initial manifold x, some singularities may form, you may have a priori, a time slice might have infinitely many connected components, okay? But in most one of them is topologically non-trivial. It could look like X with some points removed. The rest, uh, the remaining components are topologically trivial. They're basically S3 with finitely many points removed. Okay? Um, uh, and there's some finite time capital T such that all the time slices are empty beyond that time. So this is using the fact that we have a spherical space form to get an extinction result. Uh, it's based on the work of Kolding and Minikaze or Perelman. They have the either extinction <coughs> argument uh, can be used. Uh, and now, um, all right, let's let omega of g be the, the supremal time where the time t slice has a topologically non-trivial component, right, as in, as in this, right? So then, um, as you approach this time omega g, this time slice, mt, has a unique component, diffeomorphic to x, so now there are no punctures. Like as we approach this time, we see a copy of X, and this becomes asymptotically round as, as you approach this time. Right? So in other words, this family of Ramanian manifolds uh, converges modular rescaling to a, a, a X with some constant curvature metric. Okay? So let, uh, let, let me just recap this in terms of a picture. Okay? So we start with our initial manifold, this should be x. We run forward, maybe we see a neck pinch here. So this little symbol here is supposed to mean interesting topology, right? 
Uh, Richard said this is the international sim uh, symbol for topology. <laughs> Not trivial topology. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, it looks like a torus. Uh, uh, spent two days trying to figure out how to represent non-trivial topology in a diagram. And then anyway. Um, so, uh, right, so the neck pinch occurs here. This is our three sphere, so it's an un uninteresting going forward. Maybe it does something, but we don't care. We keep track of the one with non a component with non-trivial topology. Maybe another neck pinch occurs. But eventually, to this, to the statement I just made, we will see this, this inter topologically interesting component will eventually become round and go extinct. Okay? So up here, we're going to see this asymptotically shrinking round metric. Okay? So this is much more complicated than what we saw in dimension two, but nonetheless, there's some remnant of this, the two-dimensional story. Okay? So the next ingredient was also in the, in the paper with John. Um, if you have a singular Ricci flow and you take some component z of a time slice, well, then you can find some finite subset of that time slice so that every point in the complement <coughs> lies on an integral curve of the time vector field starting at time zero. Okay, right? So we have this Ricci flow space time. If you pick a point, then you can try to follow the, time, the, the integral curve of the time vector field, either forward or backward, right? So what this is saying is, if you try to go backward to time zero, you'll succeed at all but finitely many points in the time slice, okay? This is very different from trying to go, trying to go forward. When you go forward, lots of points can, can de be destroyed, okay? So this we call, this call these, these guys in S are the points with bad world lines, and there are finitely many of those. So, uh, so here's the picture. So let's, let's think about what happens to this component that's asymptotically around. Now, suppose you try to go backward in time. Well, if you're in a point here, you'll just kind of go backward to time zero. But if you start over here, now maybe you're on a part which is, as, as you go backward in time, it emerges from this thing which, which was sort of a cuspidal singularity, okay? So there's, it turns out that the argument actually shows that what's happening, there'll be at most one point on that fingertip, there'll be exactly one point in that fingertip which goes singular as you go backward in time and every other point manages to avoid that singularity, okay? But the upshot is that by f I can take this thing here, I can puncture it at finitely many points, okay? And everything else can be flowed all the way back to the time zero slice, okay? So this gives me a diffeomorphism, an embedding from that punctured time slice to an open subset of the time zero slice, right? It's all called W. And so then we can use that flow, we can push forward this family of asymptotically round metrics, right? So I'm gonna take, think about the metric on these time slices as we go forward and they become asymptotically round. I'll rescale them to normalize curvature and then push them all forward. They're gonna live on, that's gonna give me a family of metrics here, which, which are going to limit to a metric with constant curvature one, okay? Um, so what we get is a canonical partially defined metric, curvature one metric, defined on some open set that depends on G, and let's call it metric G check, okay? And by construction, this is going to be isometric to X with some finite set deleted with a metric with curvature one, okay? This is my, my favorite curvature one metric on X, okay? Okay, so now, yeah, so using a continuity property that I mentioned before, you can show that this assignment, you start with the metric G, you go to this par canonical partially defined curvature one metric, this is continuous in appropriate sense. Okay, so now let's go back to the proof of the main theorem. So remember, uh, so we have a spherical <laughs> space form different from S sphere RP3. Uh, we pick, uh, yeah, this is our curvature one metric, and we want to show that this space is contractible, right? So we want to show its homotopy groups are trivial. So for every m, pi m, pi m of this guy is trivial. <coughs> so let's pick a, an m sphere in, a map, a map of an n sphere into this space, continuous map. <coughs> and right, so uh, we want to extend that to a map of the m plus one disk in here, right? That's saying that it's null homotopic. Um, well, let's first extend it to a map into the space of all metrics, okay? The space of all metrics is contractible, or it's just a convex subset of an affine space. So we can do that. Then 
Uh, so then for every point in this m plus one disk, right, we get this extension, which is an art, some, some metric on, on x. Uh, and then we can apply this Ricci flow construction I had before. And we get a partially defined metric. That's w sub gp, g check of p, okay? So as p varies, we see these subsets that are varying, but on each subset, we see a constant curvature metric, okay? So the idea, uh, yeah, it's hidden there. So to complete the proof, we extend this metric to all of x, okay? So let me just uh, give you a quick sketch of, of how that uh, extension works. So, so let's look at, uh, <coughs> right, we have this last minute, this metric here, this is in some late time slice with finitely many punctures. We have a metric here, which is, which is modulo scaling converging to, to something with curvature one, okay? So we can think of having a metric here, which has curvature identically one, and then we flow this back using the trajectories of the time vector field to, uh, to uh, a, a subset of, of x, so it's going to be, the, its complement is going to be some possibly horrible closed set, okay? But we push forward this curvature one metric, and so what we see here is a metric with curvature one on the complement of this closed set, okay? So now let's come back here. So we have finitely many punctures, each of them, so we can cover them by disjoint three disks here. So here we have a three disk, okay? Uh, but the part that lies in, uh, away from the puncture is going to be an end, which is an S2 cross non-negative reals, okay? So mapping those, 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 those collars around these points, under the diffeomorphism, what we get is some sort of collar around each of these guys here, okay? So I'm talking about this region here, and similarly for the others, okay? So we have, uh, so this is the picture I have for a single point in this M plus one disk. Right? So the task is to extend this metric over this region. Right? It has curvature one, but I want to extend it over this region. Well, just from topology, it turns out you can see that the, this, this entire region here, and all of these guys, these are all three disks. So let's call these, uh, these are three disks. So we have the task, we have a three disk here. We have a met curvature one metric defined near the boundary of the three disk and we want to extend it over the three disk, okay? So from the construction, it's not hard to see that, uh, well, okay, so let's think about this. Conceptually, we have a three disk, we have some neighborhood of the boundary, two sphere, and here we have a curvature one metric, which is defined, okay? So for such metrics, you have a developing map, dev, uh, which goes to the three sphere with the, with the standard metric, so this developing map is uh, an isometric immersion, right? And it's canonical up to post-composition with an isometry, okay? Now in this case, you can show this is actually an embedding, okay? So you have the embedding of this, this region here into S3. So something like this, okay? But since we're in the three sphere, this region bounds, bounds a three disk, okay? So you can extend this, maybe after restricting it to a slightly smaller region, you can extend it to a diffeomorphism of this three disk to this, this, this three disk here, okay? So when you pull back the metric, you get an extension, which has curvature one, okay? So that's how you extend the metric for a single guy. Now the point is, uh, this extension process is basically, it's unique up to a diff making a different choice of the parameterization of this three disk, right? but it's a different choice which agrees near the boundary, okay? So the ambiguity corresponds to precomposing with the diffeomorphism of the three disk, which is the identity on the boundary, okay? And Hatcher's theorem for the three sphere tells you that that's contractible ambiguity, okay? So the idea is, so now if you have a parameterized family, it's a little bit like obstruction theory, where you have a trivial obstruction group coming from the, the contractibility of these guys, okay? So I'll stop there. Questions?
So the yeah. very last step you mentioned it looks like you're using Hatch's theorem to yes. prove the general theorem. Yes. Yes. And now you're in the process of proving Hatch's theorem with similar ideas. Uh, using Ricci flow, it's a different. The last part, of this, yeah, it uses Ricci flow, uses the space-time geometry, but it uses it in a different way. You didn't mention non-simple manifolds. This is some kind of interesting story. I, I think I made some conjectures some years ago about BD for non-simple manifolds. In particular, one can make a guess for handle bodies, say, yeah? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, and one can it should be all, it should be some complicated processes, next and so on. Um, yes. Uh, so I, I, I said, I assumed irreducible. So there, there is some work on this. Hatcher has work. Um, I don't know the literature that well, but uh, the picture is, as you said, it's it's m more it's more complicated. Uh, I suspect that the analysis won't really tell you anything. It, it's, uh, yeah, but for example, for candle body, one can guess that the deep of candle body for genus bigger than one is the following one. It's the linear map for model space, and on the boundary, you can see the closed subset when you get genus zero curves connected by uh, things, and consider tubal neighborhood when you move. And intersect with interior of modular space. So it will be some complicated, not KP1 space. So are, do you know, Hat I think it's Hatcher has some work on this. Of, oh, oh, someone's indicating. <laughs> Maybe you, you're talking to the wrong person. Uh, d are you, do you know the literature on this? There's some work, but I mean, it's, I, I'm not the right person to be talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we can get you two together after. <laughs> So if you have a, a compact Lie group action, action on a space form, this also proves it's conjugate to a subgroup by a solitary group? Yes, but I mean, this, this, this was already known by uh, the Orbifold theorem. Uh, in fact, yeah. Is that a smooth conjugacy? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, in, in the case, uh, the, I think the only interesting case, the, the only case we have to do work is when the group is zero dimensional, because otherwise it boils down to something two dimensional. Yeah. I mean, where you have to work, you use serious technology. And that's an overfold term. No more operation? Right. Thank you again.